get started because this is something of an abbreviated version. Uh, we had to eat, you know. <laughs> uh, tonight's topic is the topic of devotions in general and the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus in particular. And we chose that particular devotion. Why? Right. It's St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, the patron saint of our parish, was the one who, I won't say invented this, but she's certainly the one who made it into the most popular devotion of the late 19th, early 20th century. Now, I can say that with some authority because I snuck in there. <laughs> okay. And in my home, we had two, count them, two paintings of Jesus and the Sacred Heart. Why did we have two? Well, my mother had one, <laughs> okay, and my grandmother had one. <laughs> All right, uh, but they both stayed in the same bedroom, so we had to sort of break that up. Uh, we didn't want competing versions. Uh, first, a word about devotions. Uh, when you're a Catholic, you use language differently. You just do, and you, most of the time, you don't even notice it. Can I have a volunteer to use the word devotion in a sentence? <laughs> Good excuse. I have a devotion to Mary, the mother of Sarah. Perfect. What we have here is the classic Catholic answer. I have a devotion, she says, to Our Lady, the mother of Sarah. I use it in the seven sorrows you just do. Right, right. Okay, that's a popular devotion, by the way. We Catholics use the term in almost, it's not quite, but it's almost a unique way. When people use the word devotion, they typically mean something like, well, I am devoted to you. I'm devoted to you. So if you wanted me to say it, I could say it awkwardly and say, I have a devotion to you. But that's not how people usually use the word. Catholics use the word devotion as a noun more often than anybody else. Because we use it in a very particular way. We use it to describe a practice, something that we actually do. So having a devotion means you're doing something, OK? Now, it does have the meaning, for example, if I have a devotion to the Sorrowful Mother, our Mother of Sorrows, the uh, Queen of Sorrows, any of those titles will work. That does mean I am devoted to her, but it means more than that. It means that I'm doing something. That's what the devotion is, whatever it is that you do. Okay. Now, there are several, well, indeed, there are many devotions in the Catholic faith. The most famous, and indeed probably the only completely official one, is the rosary. Some people even say it as, I have a devotion to the rosary, right? But what that simply means is you pray the rosary a lot, okay? Most of the time when we use the term devotion, we mean that we have a devotion to some particular characteristic or aspect of Jesus' life or Mary's life. Okay? And because of that, we do certain things. We say certain prayers, we go to church at certain times, and we do certain practices. Okay? As an example, when we talk about the devotion to the Sacred Heart that St. Margaret Mary made popular, one of the things you do if you are, have a devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is you have a picture and you put it up in your house, right? In fact, that was the very first thing people did. They got the picture and they put it up in their house. Devotions tend to do that to us or do that with us. They give us an image, a picture. It's something that is material, all right? You can touch it, you can 
pick it up and look at it. And it's something that inspires the imagination, that enables you to place yourself in a certain relationship with Jesus or Mary, given the characteristic that you are particularly devoted to. A devotion to the Mother of Sorrows, for example, is a way of putting yourself with Mary at the foot of the cross, right? The primary place where Mary would be sorrowful. Got it? Okay. And that's the point. Because the point of devotions are, on the one hand, to enable you to live your faith in very specific ways, but also to feel your faith. Devotions without embarrassment play upon the emotions. Their purpose is to make us fervent, to make us enthusiastic, to make us feel <coughs> closer to God. Right? This is not a bad thing. This is a good thing. Right? Their goal is to make our faith that much more real in our life because it affects us, it causes us to have real emotions, strong emotions. Everyone on board so far? Okay. Let's see who's there. Oh, by the way, one of the handouts that I gave out, the first page are my notes. Okay, so if you don't want to, I probably won't get to everything here. I believe in over preparing. All right. Every devotion always has prayers, and liturgical practices as part of them. Uh, Marshall, for example, has recently been very active in bringing the rosary back into its liturgical context here at St. Margaret Mary's Parish. How and why? We just need more. <laughs> there you go. No more devotional practices. We need more devotional practices. One of the reasons why I thought this was a great topic is I'd say a few of us here are old enough to have been raised in them, including myself, all right? But many of you might never have developed one or known about one or gotten hooked on one. And that's really what it's all like. You learn about it, you start to look into it, to play with it, to practice it, and then you realize, hey, this is me. This is where I feel myself into the faith, okay? Sacred Heart of Jesus was a very important one because from the time I was really small, you all can call me they, but my full name is Margaret, Margaret Mary, no less. And Saint Margaret Mary Alacoque is my patron saint, my name saint, okay? Now, this was especially important, not only in my family, but because I went to school. Where? In that building, right over there. And we came in here to eat lunch. Okay? The floor was lower. <laughs> I, and originally it had been the gym. But we won't go into that history. <laughs> the whole point was that when the Feast of St. Margaret Mary came around, every child in the school got a candy bar. Except for one. I got two. <laughs> okay. It was a, well, of course, since I did this, and since one of the things that they taught us, told us as they were handing out the candy bars is, this is not just candy to celebrate the Saints' Feast Day. This is a candy bar to remind you that the love of Jesus Christ is the whole point of the devotion to the Sacred Heart. We got the same speech every year. Not a very long speech, short speech. Right? The love of Jesus Christ is the whole point of the devotion to the Sacred Heart. So let's talk about what Margaret Mary did, what happened, and how she developed this particular devotion. She was a visitation nun in France in the mid to late 17th century. That means 1600s. Okay? So call it a little bit before 1650 to 1690, all right? Now, she wasn't a famous person. She wasn't 
you know, a prominent person. She was middle class. Mm, well, she started out a little bit better than middle class, then they went to lower class, and then they wound up pretty much middle class again. <laughs> okay. It was a turbulent time in France. France was doing well as a whole. It was the world power. All right. But at the same time, there were wars, there were plagues. It was a big problem all around. The visitation nuns were started by, of all people, St. Francis de Sales. And he was rather frustrated because his intention in establishing the visitation sisters was to have them be a working order, an order of nuns or sisters dedicated to helping the poor out in the streets and making soup kitchens and nursing and all this other stuff. But when he made application to Rome for this order, they said, you know, we really need some more people praying. We're having trouble. We need some more prayers. Contemplatives, we call them, right? So they reached a compromise. The uh, Sisters of the Visitation were a monastic order rather than a working order. They were enclosed, but they ran schools. And they specifically ran schools originally for the poorest of the poor. Right? Then, of course, the problem is that they were really good at the job. And what happens when a school is really, really good? Rich, rich people want to send their kids there, okay? But they never, ever lost entirely the idea of educating the poor. Okay? Everyone on board so far? All right. About 100 years or so after the order was founded, here comes St. Margaret Mary. Well, she wasn't a saint yet. She was a sister. And let's be honest, she was a bad sister. She did some pretty outrageous things. Uh, she would be scrubbing the floors and she would start thinking about something and stop scrubbing floors and just sort of kneel there with her scrub brush and her pail. Well, this was great for her interior life, but it was lousy for the convent who needed its floors to clean. Okay. So they constantly had to yell at her, clean, go back to clean the floors. She was working in the kitchen and she burnt the soup. This is what she did. In fact, the people that she lived with were kind of frustrated with her. So they tried to find her something to do that she couldn't mess up. So they said, I know. Look, she's, she's not real good with things, but if she has something active in front of her, she can, she can do that pretty well. So they put her in char charge of the convent's new donkey. Donkey. <laughs> oh, come on, this is before cars. They needed donkeys to take things down. Yes, she was a young woman. She was about oh, 17 maybe at the time. And so she's out there trying to deal with the donkey, but she talks to the donkey and she's feeding the donkey and she's cleaning up after the donkey and all the things that you do with the donkey. But she decided that the donkey simply didn't understand where it was and how fortunate it was to be working for the sisters. So she took the donkey on a tour of the entire convent, including her superior's cell, her superior's bedroom. Here she comes with the donkey. <laughs> this is our mother superior. If you're very fortunate someday, you will be able to give her a ride. And the mother superior's going, what are you doing? Are you insane? or just a little bit flaky. Well, they came down with a little bit flaky. That's what got it. However, she kept promising to try and focus. And people were surprised when she was actually good at one thing, praying. She was really good at praying. Now, what you have to understand is when you join a contemplative order, one of the great challenges is to be able to sit, stand, or kneel in church and pray for not 10 minutes or 15 minutes or a half hour or an hour, but for maybe three hours at a stretch. 
right? Now, here's where I always put people to the test. Okay, folks, I want everybody to pray in silence. Go. Okay, stop. Guess how long it's been? Less. That's about right. 30 seconds, folks. I think you do for three hours. Now, to be honest, some of us have practiced. Some people are quite good at it. Okay? But very few people who haven't practiced are good at it just right when they start off. Okay? Some people fall asleep. Some people can't stand it. They start talking. I won't name anyone who would do that. Okay. They start playing games with their fingers. They start moving around. They start leaving. <laughs> okay. It's a tough thing to do. All right. Sister Margaret Mary was good at it. Okay. So they said, hey, this is not so bad. If we have now a young nun who is going to be able to take the more difficult periods of prayer, like three hours from 02 to 5 in the morning, right? Older nuns who had lots of experience in prayer could do it, but they were getting older and their bones hurt. They needed a youngster. They had one. That became her position. While she was praying, in a period of about a year and a half, she had three visions. Not really visions, I'm sorry. She had three apparitions. Anyone know the difference between a vision and an apparition? Ma'am. Is the vision something that you see in your head and an apparition is something that you see with your eyes? That's very good. And it goes even a little bit farther. An apparition usually involves more than one sense. Okay? Always involves vision. Well, I can't say that. There are a couple that have not involved vision. Uh, but it usually involves vision and maybe sensation of warmth, okay? smell, other things. You get the idea? And the key is that it involves a physical encounter with either Jesus or Mary. Why only them? Well, they're the only ones who've been involved with this thing. Boom! <laughs> See, we got experts around here. This is great. <laughs> That's exactly right. The only people that can physically appear to us all right, are those who have a physical body, even though they're dead and they've gone to heaven with me? We only got two. We've got Jesus, resurrection of the dead, Mary, assumptions into heaven. Everybody on board, we know what we're talking about here? Assumption is a kind of funny word, but it simply means Mary's body was taken into heaven after she died. Okay? So if we went and tried to dig up Mary, the mother of God, no lie. Okay? Everyone clear? Okay. So an apparition involves this, it's a 3D vision, a vision that involves more than just an interior seeing. Okay. What, when Jesus appeared to her, he appeared to her as Christ crucified. She described him as being on the cross, but there was something different about him. His heart, she could see his heart. And she saw it, yes, as a beating muscle. But more importantly, it was a bleeding muscle, a, a beating muscle, with a crown of thorns around it. And 
inflamed. No, that's the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Immaculate Heart of Mary's got the sword. <laughs> and sometimes, how many swords? Seven. Okay, actually, when it's anything Catholic, you can pretty much guess it's going to be one of certain numbers. Three, seven, twelve. Okay, almost guaranteed. Occasionally, you're going to get a four. But three, seven, twelve are the big ones. Okay? Now, she actually had a conversation with Jesus. So she had sight. She had a special feeling of warmth, as though fire was literally in the room warming her the fire of Jesus' heart. And she could hear him. And they talked together. All right? And what she heard Jesus say was, you know, okay, I'm paraphrasing. As far as I know, Jesus never said, you know. <laughs> and I don't know French, so I can't go into that. But he spoke French to her. He said something like, you know, I am glad that I suffered for you and the rest of humanity. It was a joy, my greatest joy, because I love you. I love you more than I can say or speak. And I'm not complaining, mind you, he would say. But sometimes I get the idea that I'm pouring out love giving my life out of love, and people go, yeah, that's nice. They just don't seem to get it. They don't understand that I'm doing this not because God is making me, not because I promise to. I do it simply because I love you people. I love you madly, insanely. I so much thought I could not live eternity without you that I died for you. And not a particularly pleasant death either. And I want people to get that. And St. Margaret Mary heard that and she said, you know, you're absolutely right. All the hours I spent in prayer, I never once said, I love you. I mean, I would say all the prayers, all the official prayers, but I love you wasn't one of them. So she got it into her head that maybe it was important for her to express her love for Jesus in response to his love for us. First vision. Second vision, Jesus says, you know what we were talking about last time? Again. I think it's important that it's not just between you and I. I think everybody needs to know how much I love them. I think if everyone knows how much I love them, they will find living a good Christian life is easier. It's richer. Heck, sometimes it's even fun. But he did use the word for. The, uh, the Greek word is plethora. You know, it has an overabundance. It's just the fullness of everything. Think of a great big balloon so full of air that it's about to burst. With me? That's one image. He said, his heart was so inflamed with love that the flames were unquenchable. Get the image? And she said, I could feel the heat of it beating against my skin. Yeah? This is extremely emotional, and to be honest, I don't want to say the word sexual, I want to use the word sensual. It involved Margaret Mary's body. She could feel the heat. Third vision. You know what we were talking about last time? <laughs> we gotta get the Pope in on this. Okay, that's that's what you're gonna do. You you were gonna write to the Pope. She says, excuse me. 
She says, no. He says, no, it's not going to be a problem. You're just going to write to the Pope. She says, I don't write to the Pope. I barely write. He said, no problem. Okay, I'll be with you. And she's going, no, this is, you don't understand. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Judy, I need you to do me a favor. Would you mind calling Pope Francis and see if we could get him into a chat room? <laughs> well, he did it for people in Brazil. That's yeah, true. Yeah. Gonna make a phone call. Don's over there. <laughs> there you go. Call your son. <laughs> Tell him that his going to be cold. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you guys get the idea that this might be a bit of a stretch? Right? She's just an 18-year-old girl. 19 years. Whatever. She's not famous. Nobody knows who she is. I mean, her family does. Yeah, and she could read and write, sort of. Right? But she could write to the public. No, well, let's put it this way. She would be afraid that, first of all, yeah, it's like someone's going to deliver, deliver, hey, your holiness, message from this convent in France. I don't know where in France. It's no place famous. It's, you know, out in the hill somewhere. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's from a vineyard. I, I don't know. Anyway, here's this message from the convent. Oh, the Pope's going to say, yeah, I, I, got, I need to get right on that one. Okay. And then if the Pope should open it up, he's going to read this sort of awkward letter and going to say, oh, yeah, this is a person that's making lots of sense. <laughs> I mean, you know how she's feeling, right? Okay? She is not thinking, oh, well, since Jesus told me to do it, sure. Okay? Your holy, dear your holiness, <laughs> dear Pope, how do you start a letter to the Pope anyway? <laughs> okay, however you start it, okay, dear Pope, um, Jesus was talking to me yesterday, and he told me that I should write you a letter. Is this going well? <laughs> okay, she's feeling foolish. Now, we've already had these very powerful experiences of love, but that doesn't stop her from feeling foolish. Okay? She couldn't help it. Right? Jesus himself. According to her account of this that she wrote before her spiritual director, Jesus himself chuckled a little bit. Okay. An amount of amusement. And again, the constant reassurance. Look, don't worry. It's not you who have to be impressive. Trust me, I'm impressive enough. Well, that puts another spin on it, doesn't it? Okay. But instead of appearing to the Pope directly, Jesus chooses to appear to this very obscure French nun and ask her to write to the Pope. St. Margaret Mary says, you know, this is not a plan for success. Okay, those weren't her exact words. She voiced her fear of being inadequate to the task. Basically, look, Jesus, my Lord, I do love you. But if you really wanted this to work, you should appear to a bishop at least, okay? <laughs> Somebody who has a shot. Huh? No. So guess what she does? After feeling like a fool for a couple of days, she writes a letter to the Pope. <laughs> okay. Now, to know, not to her surprise, guess what happened? Nothing. Did he ever read it? We don't know. All we know is nothing happened. Yes. But in this letter to the Pope, was she he she was supposed to express how much God loves us? Is that what it was? It goes a little bit further than that. He she was supposed to express how much Jesus loved us, which is of course the embodiment of God's love. Right? Jesus, God became flesh, God became man, incarnate. Okay. So, Jesus loves us so much that he is inflamed with love. And when we really, really recognize that, our hearts are inflamed with love in return. So she has to express that to the husband. Right, and 
then tell them you got to do some certain things. You got to declare a feast of the Sacred Heart, okay, <laughs> on this particular day. I think it's nine days after Pentecost. I mean, you, we got very specific instructions here, okay? <laughs> okay. Your Holiness, here's what you have to do. You have to declare a feast for the entire church nine days after Pentecost, not ten, not eight, nine. <laughs> okay? <laughs> And uh, you've got to issue indulgences for everyone who practices the devotion to the Sacred Heart. Now, this is where I'm going to tap into some memories, I think. Anybody here remember the phrase, First Fridays? Okay. What was big? What were we supposed to do on First Fridays? Go to Mass. Go to Mass. But not only go to Mass, originally... It was go to mass and no. go to mass and boom, 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 receive communion. Now, wait a second. How many of you go to mass without receiving communion? <laughs> Sometimes? Okay. Good old fashioned girl. I'm with you. Okay. My aunt, my Aunt Mary Ivor for most of her life, did the obligatory reception of communion. Anyone know what that is, church law? Once a year. Once a year. She never went more often to, than that, till the last five years of her life. Why? She really didn't feel worthy. Okay? In fact, there's a hymn, Oh, Lord, I am not worthy. Right? Okay. So it's an old-fashioned communion hymn. I don't, didn't do the tune really well, but I do what I can. Okay. Back in the day, as in Middle Ages, let's call it 1300s through the 1900s, people, Catholics, were reluctant to receive communion. This is generally foreign to people today. Okay? Because... We're in church, we're going to receive. Oh, one girl that I was talking to the other day actually said it's automatic, which sort of freaked me out a little bit. Right? But when you go to church, you receive communion. I mean, some of us would even go so far as to say, isn't that the point? <laughs> I mean, well, it's an important point. I'm not sure I'd say it's the point, but sure is up there. Okay? But back then, people were reluctant. Primarily, in Sister Margaret Mary's day, she, they were reluctant because they were caught up in an atmosphere where people began to believe that human beings were horrible things, okay? not worthy of God's attention. We were lucky God even thought of us doing <coughs> them. Right? We were simply dirt. Uh, without the pious over of Jonathan Edwards. There's a famous bit of Christian literature in American history, Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. You guys heard this? We are as loathsome spiders in the hands of God, held out over the eternal fire, just the slightest motion, and God will drop us, miserable sinners that we are, into the flames of hell. That's it. Halloween. Now, to be honest, to give Jonathan Edwards credit, it's not just terror and ugliness in his sermon. But in the minds of the people of Sister Margaret Mary's day, that was it. So now you begin to see why experiencing the love of Christ was something of an accomplishment. And now, telling everybody to love Jesus... If they get, just get close to Jesus, they will feel his love for them, and they will love him in return, was a pretty revolutionary idea. Right? So she instituted not only the practice of thinking of Jesus' love for us as a heart literally on fire right? that would warm us and inflame our hearts in return, but she instituted certain practices. You go to nine First Fridays, nine months. You go to, the, to Mass on the first Friday of the month, 
and you receive communion. I don't care if you are scared. You say certain prayers. Some are private prayers. Some are liturgical prayers that you say in the church for certain feasts, like the Feast of the Sacred Heart, once it comes around. Okay. Now, by the way, it didn't happen automatically. Okay, It took about 200, 250 years for the feast to be declared. But it was established in her own convent as a legitimate feast during her lifetime. All right? and in all of France very soon afterwards. Okay? By the way, that, that tends to be a thing. I think it's kind of touching when you think about it, that if it's one of us, okay, it has a kind of extra appeal. Hey, this is a French woman, all right? Okay? In our own lifetimes, this has happened again, and by the way, with the kind of the highest authority. You guys heard of Divine Mercy Sunday, haven't you? Okay. By the way, that is a daughter of the Sacred Heart. Because Divine Mercy, you know what the devotion is to? To the heart of Jesus, from which flows, in this case, not heat, not flame, but light. White and red. White for water. Red for blood. Right? The water which washes us clean, the blood that gives us life. Okay? Right? It focuses on nine days, okay, starting during Holy Week. Right? But St. Margaret Mary's, no, hers was nine first Fridays. Friday, why Friday? The day Jesus died. The day that he showed his love for us. You begin to get this? They're trying to connect things. She. I would argue Jesus is trying to connect things in our mind. First and foremost, his love for us. That's the reason why he came human, died, and gave us the Eucharist. Just because he loved us. And he could not imagine eternity without us. Some people say, oh, Jesus doesn't need us. They're right. Jesus doesn't need us. But he wants us. He wants us desperately. That's even better. Yes. Okay. So when you're thinking of this, you should be thinking of St. Margaret Mary, sacred heart inflamed with love, death of Jesus on the cross, the greatest expression of that love. Right? First Friday Masses. Communion, receive communion. She also instituted the practice of the holy hour. Right? Okay. And she also did something what was very important during her time. She asked that all prayers that we use when we pray to the sacred heart of Jesus, no, we're not just praying to the beating muscle. What we're doing is we're thinking of Jesus' love for us when we pray. Everyone on board? Mm -hmm. When we do that, we make a special prayer at that time for the souls in purgatory. Now, everyone should be cocking their heads and going, well, that's nice, but why the souls in purgatory? I mean, what have they got? <laughs> I mean, what did they do? Well, this is what you have to remember when she was living. She was living during a time after the Reformation, there was a long, probably 300 year period called the Counter Reformation. That's when the Catholic Church responded to the Reformation. And some people think of it as this Counter Reformation, Anti Reformation. They have the Reformation and we're going to stomp them down. A better way, at least according to Sister Margaret Mary, would be to think of this as an alternative Reformation. Okay? We have the Reformation done by Protestants who saw problems with the church right, and who started their own. We, the Catholics in the church, see problems in the church. And we're going to do something about it. Purgatory was one of the reasons why people were afraid of being too sinful to approach God. Right? Purgatory was thought of popularly 
by the way, this is not the church teaching on purgatory, okay? But it was thought of like this. Purgatory is like a mini hell, okay? It's not quite as bad as hell, but it's darn close. And if you're in purgatory, you better pray you're going to get out, because you might not. Now, by the way, just officially that's a heresy, <laughs> okay? That means that is false teaching, okay? <laughs> I listen, and I'm not alone in this. Um, every now and then you're going to pick up an old Catholic novel, and you're going to find one of the characters expressing this view, and no one corrects it. No one says, what do you mean, if you get out of purgatory? Okay? The whole point of purgatory is that you are saved. Purgatory is, let's see, uh, Father Eric, he used to call it the front porch of heaven where you clean off your boots. I prefer to think of it as the bathhouse of heaven. You see, we Catholics think of sin in a bodily sense. I mean, we're sacramental about everything, including sin. Okay? When we sin, it's as though our bodies are rolling in stinking mud, and we eat a really rotten, bad onion. Okay? So for every sin, we roll in stinking mud, and we eat a really bad onion. Everyone with me? <laughs> We die and go to heaven, and we look, and there in heaven are all of our friends and neighbors and the saints, and they are gloriously beautiful. And what are we? We're pretty stinky. Okay? And God says, welcome, my beloved child. Enter into your joy. We have longed for your coming. And we say, uh, if you hug me, you're going to regret it. <laughs> I says, no, you don't understand. We love you. We don't care. We don't care in the least how you smell and how you look. We love you. We're willing to do anything for you. Can, can I have a bath and a toothbrush? Purgatory, right there. The souls in purgatory are there because they want to be there. And even saying there, it's like heaven is where? <laughs> yeah, right, okay. But let's go into space and let's look for it. <laughs> okay. okay. Hell is where? Down, Down below somewhere. somewhere. Let's go to the center of the earth and see if we can find hell. Sorry, you're not going to win. Okay? These are spiritual states, heaven and hell. Purgatory is in between, in, only in the sense of it addresses what has happened here on earth in a realistic fashion. Not in the sense of there are actually real flames and so forth, but it faces the fact that sin has effects on us. When we do wrong, we wound ourselves. Maybe we should call purgatory the hospital that gets us to heaven because it's where our wounds are healed. Okay? Everything that we've done wrong is not only forgiven, forgotten, overlooked, Rather, it is addressed, healed, made clean and whole. Some people say to this extent, I love this, when you are free from purgatory and enter into heaven, you almost say, oh, that was a pretty lucky sin I did, it wasn't it? Now, this shouldn't shock you. Easter Vigil, oh happy fault, unnecessary sin of Adam that bought for us so great a savior? I mean, come on. That's cool. The doctrine of purgatory is about love. St. Margaret Mary brought that back. Instead of being fear of punishment, it's about love. You're there because you want to love God with all your heart, and your heart isn't up to it yet. That's simple. We pray for those in purgatory pretty much the same way we cheer for teams on the field. Now, anybody here in sports? Which one of you does sports? Huh? Oh, come on. Okay. Uh, anybody, any athletes in here? Anybody? Athletes? Oh, man, I missed my audience big time. Okay, well then, just pretend. As I said, my, my, uh, my mother brought me up to love sports, and we are convinced that if you are there cheering a team on, you are actually helping them. Anybody who has been on a team, 
on the court, on the football field, they'll say, yeah, it kind of works. It's called home field advantage. Okay? What is that? Home teams win more often than they lose most of the time because they got 10,000 people screaming their lungs out, giving them energy. You with me? Prayers work in the same way. You pray for someone to help them get through. Help them to get whole and get clean. Right? That helps. Their ears are open just a little bit more to what they have to get done. Their heart is just a little bit more encouraged to get that done. You with me? Okay. So purgatory is not about punishment. It's about love. And that's what St. Margaret Mary brought back. What do you do with the devotion to the Sacred Heart? Well, you start with nine. Nine consecutive First Fridays. Nine months, First Friday, you go to Mass and you receive communion. You spend a holy hour every now and then. How often? As often as you can. That's where you go to the church, you sit in front of the tabernacle, and you pray to Jesus. Okay? About love. Okay? The next thing you do is make sure you have that picture of the Holy of the Sacred Heart of Jesus in your house. Okay? Sometimes you can dedicate yourself and your entire life to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is just a personal way of saying to loving Jesus as he has loved us. Everyone on board on what's going on here? Have I been able to communicate at all how this is about getting emotion into our faith? Getting physical reality into our faith? And getting actual practices into our faith? Because if I had, that's what I wanted to do. I'm not going to do any of the other stuff, but if you flip to the third page of the hand, it starts with the invocation of the most sacred heart of Jesus. This is where an invocation is simply where you call someone to you. You invoke them. This is a short prayer that St. Margaret Mary herself wrote that she said five or six times a day. What, what times? Didn't matter. Whenever it crossed her mind. Okay? She tried to make sure it crossed her mind at least five, at least five or six times a day. Okay? Now, it goes this way. O oh, heart of love, I put all my trust in thee, for I fear all things from my own weakness, but I hope for all things from thy goodness. Amen. Right? What she told people to do, by the way, including the Pope, memorize it. By the way, if you don't want to memorize it, paraphrase it. Okay? Change the words. We're allowed. Okay? O oh, heart of love, O oh, heart of on fire, I trust you completely. I am weak, but I hope for all things through you. Amen. Make them up. We're allowed. The key is get the prayer by heart. Get it? By heart. <laughs> okay, yeah, I okay, corny, but literally that's what it used to mean. You get it so that it is in your heart, that you can pray it from the heart without looking at anything, without reading anything. You know it in your heart. Right? Now, I'm going to suggest we do the litany of the Most Sacred Heart of Jesus. Because this is the prayer that devotees, those devoted to the Sacred Heart, will say in a liturgy, in a mass that's done for one of their members, in a saying of the rosary, a communal saying of the rosary. And I suggest we do, we say this prayer in this way. Okay? Typically, litanies go like this. There's the verse, one person, more than one person, and then there's the response, everybody else. Got it? Trust me, that's not nearly as much fun as what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do that for the Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Jesus hear us part, okay? Then it says, where it starts, God the Father of heaven, 
what's the response to that is the same as is for all these. Gracious, Jesus graciously hear us. Got it? Okay? But here's what I suggest. As of now, you folks are V. We are R. Okay? Got it? However, when we hit to when we got hit the God the Father of heaven, Jesus graciously hear us, okay? We take turns. Right? <coughs> First one side says, God the Father of heaven, we all say, Jesus graciously hear us. Then this side says, God the Son, Redeemer of the world, Jesus graciously hears us. You get it? Okay, now I'm going to be sort of orchestrating this. Yes. Okay, and if I get confused, you folks are supposed to bring me back to earth, okay? All right, this will be our closing for this evening. So, first we're going to start with the V's. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Jesus hear us. Jesus graciously hear us. Please pause for a moment. I forgot. No, the response is not Jesus graciously hear us. It's have mercy on us. Got it? Okay. Over here we start with the V's. God the Father of heaven. Have mercy on us. God the Son, Redeemer of the world. Have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God. Have mercy on us. Our Lord Jesus, Son of the Eternal Father. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, born by the Holy Spirit, the womb of the Virgin Mother. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, substantially united to the Word of God. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, of infinite majesty. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, the sacred temple of God. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, tabernacle of the Most High. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, house of God and gate of heaven. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, burning for us of charity. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, abode of justice and love. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, full of goodness and love. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, abyss of all virtues. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, most worthy of all praise. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, King and center of all hearts. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, in whom the Father was well pleased. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, of whose fullness we have all received. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, desire of the everlasting hills, have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, patient and most merciful, have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, enriching all the devotion, have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, the of the Lord, have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, propitiation for our sins. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, loaded down with a program. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, bruised for our offenses. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, obedient to death. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, pierced with a lance. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, source of all consolation. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, our life and resurrection. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, our peace and reconciliation. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, victim for our sins. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, salvation of those who trust in you. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, hope of those who die in you. Have mercy on us. Heart of Jesus, the delight of all the saints, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who 
take away the sins of the world. Spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Jesus, meek and humble of heart, make our hearts like to yours. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, look upon the heart of your most beloved Son, and upon the praises and satisfaction which he offers you in the name of sinners, and to those who implore your mercy in your great goodness, grant forgiveness in the name of the Saint Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. That concludes the official meeting. We're having the official session for tonight. There is, however, a meeting of the Faith Formation Advisory Committee, also known as FFAC, which you're more than invited to attend if you so wish. But thank you all for coming if you need to go now. Yes. <coughs>